Hi, this is Joseph with TouchSense and that signals somatics on Twitter. In fact, yesterday on Twitter, I saw a, a post by um, Sam at SC Sager uh, where he was mentioning something that he had seen on Wikipedia uh, regarding cranial and it wasn't that favorable, um, which as I read it, I wasn't that surprised at the, at the comments, but basically they believe they can feel the movement of the bones in their head and stuff like this. Well, I was talking to a young lady uh, a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine's daughter, in fact, and she had done her first cranial, uh, first cranial training and uh, had in fact said this to me just a couple weeks ago uh, and she was pretty excited and said, you know, can really feel the bones move and it's amazing and I was like well careful how you say that and 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 who you say it to meaning you know I mean because she's young and she's going to be in science classes anatomy classes physiology classes and if you think that's going to go over well to your physiology you're not going to impress your college anatomy teacher by talking about movement of bones in the head <laughs> you're not going to get an A plus so you know and this is how, uh, it, it, well, what did Mark Twain say? You know, I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. And good for her, because she's not. But I wanted to kind of clarify that. What I also commented to her is that what we learn to do in cranial and many of these other therapies, and therapeutic modalities, is we learn to perceive something that may be quite subtle. And in part of that, or, or what comes right after that, if you will, we learn to amplify that perception so that it becomes bigger in our perceptual field. That's an important thing um, because you can feel things that are very, very um, subtle. And you can learn to amplify those things. Um, so, so that, that's really kind of the long and short of that. And I think she kind of got the gist of it. I think some of this, it depends on who the teacher is and, and, uh, and how they teach it. There's no doubt that especially, I mean, look at, the, look at braces. So the idea that the bones and the cranial facial system don't move is kind of silly, really. Uh, we, we know that they do from things like that. I, I saw something, something they're currently doing is they're putting halos, you know, somebody came up with a bright idea. They probably had cranial and said, you know, I could get rich doing this. And they came up with halos that can, they can put on an infant's head that will keep it um, the, in a, that shape. So, uh, you know, it's using Wolf's law, that's a physiologic law that says that bone adapts to the pressures and tensions that are put on it, so that they're using that. It's also saying that somebody recognizes that those cranial bones in the shape of their head, especially easily in infants, can be influenced. So, you, you know, you kind of want to have it both ways, uh, uh, is, is what I hear from that. And uh, you just kind of have to laugh. And if you're results oriented and, uh, you know, you want to help people, you kind of learn to blow some, a lot of that stuff off pretty quickly because it's just not, if people are happy with, your, with, the, with the service you're providing, you're helping them. It's just not, you know, it's just, you've already, it's water under the bridge. They're gone. Doesn't even matter. So, right, they're not your customer. They're not going to be your patient. They're going to go somewhere else and let them have whatever that brings them. It may bring them something very effective and good, and it may bring them something else. So I'm not the one who's in charge of that, but I have seen, uh, I've lived long enough to have seen these kinds of things. Um, so in the United States, you know, uh, John Upledger brought cranial therapy to the fore. He called it craniosacral therapy. And, you know, kind of you have the head and the, you know, approaching the tailbone. The sacrum isn't really the tailbone. But um, but it is, you do have the parasympathetics there, right? And you have the sympathetics in between. You have the parasympathetics here and in the, the pelvic parasympathetics. So there's that relationship, which is interesting. Um, 
And it and it's more than that, but but there is that. And then of course you have, I mean, you have the this meningeal or or um, yeah, the meningeal system within the head, spinal canal. It ends in the sacrum as well. It has two basically, kind of usually attaches to the sacrum there. Um, so, so you have these models, but, but uh, Upledger really brought that out into the public. He, in fact, taught the public. He taught mothers of autistic kids, all kinds of things. Uh, he connected with other like-minded, broad-minded, giving uh, osteopaths like Jean-Pierre Barral and expanded a teaching empire. Uh, you know, his son, John Jr., carried that on. Um, after his after his death and uh, now they're both gone and I mean the Institute's still there but but um, you know I don't know who's really um, you know the generative um, doing the generative work you know the creative work so because these are dynamic processes that's why I pointed out like uh, uh, Sutherland 2014 to 2050, or, uh, excuse me, 1914 to 1954, right? So after he's gone, right, someone else took over, right? Roland Becker and, uh, you know, Ann Wales and who, whoever else took over, right? So those, those were his students. They took, they took the helm and put that forth. In fact, it's an interesting point because folks like Roland Becker started to get interested in some of the metaphysics, right? And, and they started really noticing something else. Uh, they don't, you have to read carefully and you have to read between the lines. And I don't even know if they were actually fully conscious of it. It depends on your background and what you might be uh, familiar with. Uh, but some of what I think they started to do when they started, but, so you have your thoracic respiration, that's what everyone's doing if they're breathing. And then you have your uh, primary respiratory mechanism. Primary respiratory mechanism. Which, you know, in one way can be described as, you know, the undulation that occurs embryologically as we, you know, develop in utero primary respiratory mechanism. So that's how we were breathing. We weren't breathing, but we were getting this influx from our mother. And we developed along that line, right? That neural line and, and things spread out from there. But it was a, a relative, you know, generally it was very symmetric. You know, it's a symmetric movement pattern as is the cranial rhythmic impulse and as as is the uh, movement of the meninges basically so uh, but they started getting interested and if you listen to the the if you read the materials which it's been a while since I've looked at Becker's work oh gosh it's, it's just it's great stuff if you haven't spent time with it but um, you know, he, he talks about kind of, you know, branching out a little bit. And you can see by some of the people, um, I don't have the reference in my head, but some of them were, get, were a little esoteric. And that's, that's great stuff. But, you know, uh, one that I wanted to mention, it's a, it's a segue away from this, but this, I'm going to take it because it's right here. Um, you know, the, the breathing mechanisms here at the brainstem were pretty much, I think, devel uh, d discovered in the early 90s. I think I jotted down the name, what they call it? Pre-Botzinger complex. Pre-Botzinger, for those of you who want to know that. But, but basically, the, the respiratory mechanism, that which signals you to breathe, is in the medulla oblongata. Well, Paramahansa Yogananda you know, the yogi that brought, brought uh, self-realization fellowship stuff. It's just an aside. I, you know, I'm not, uh, it's not specifically my thing, but I'm sharing something with you that if you've read 
and studied some of these things, then you can piece some things together. And you know, he's talking about the Mandula Oblongata all the way back then. Uh, you know, he was around in the 50s. I think he came over to the States and England in the 50s. If my uh, history is a little off, I'm sure it might be a little bit off, but I don't think it's wildly off track. Um, but he was talking about the medulla oblongata. Well, they didn't discover some of those centers in the brainstem till uh, the 90s, the early 90s. And it's a lot like that, right? So they got the ancient Tibetans working on people's heads, right? Just to feel in the pulses and working with whatever they were, how, whatever their system was. And then you get a guy like, uh, Sutherland, he comes along and he develops it along his perceptual pathway. And he was a trained osteopath, so he used those uh, concepts as constraints to develop his system so that he could teach his fellow osteopaths who were similarly constrained by those concepts. So, um, anyway, so that gives us a little bit of background on, on some cranial therapy. But uh, surely we can work with um, uh, I was going to say spinal taps and epidurals, uh, whiplash, concussions, uh, of, you know, head when they've needed to do head surgeries, I worked with someone recently, they just almost just barely, a little older, but just barely tapped her head, you know, she bumped her head on the uh, hatchback of her car and uh, started getting headaches a few days later, hadn't even mentioned it to her partner. Turns out she had a, like, I don't remember exactly, but four and a half centimeter uh, hematoma, subdural hematoma, uh, that was displacing, you know, a whole hemisphere of her brain. Well, they, of course, uh, cut a hole and, and drained that off, and, and, uh, and she's fine. But, you know, cranial work for someone like that is really useful uh, to get those rhythms back online. Um, whip, uh, whiplash injuries, very, very big, you know, when the, the brain... We know these forces, especially in these kinds of forces of a you know, rear end or a, you know, you wear, someone rear ends the person in front of them or they're rear ended. You know, the, these kinds of forces are very disruptive and they occur along the same line generally as that primary respiratory mechanism. Uh, and speaking of that, that's what I was saying with regard to Becker is that they were noticing, they started to notice that this thing, this primary respiratory mechanism, if you really read the writings uh, of some of those folks, they will talk about it taking on a life of its own. Well, that's where you start to move into this interface between Kundalini, the individual uh, energetic system, and kind of a more where how that interfaces with the more general or universal energetic system. Um, you know, it depends on if one's trying, wants to, or is trying to do that kind of work. I personally try and keep it a little more mechanical than trying to work with uh, those elements. Uh, but that's my take. People do it, and I'm sure the results are incredible. The, my concern would be the hit that the therapist takes because uh, there's no free lunches in the physical or in the energetic realm. So when you start taking those things on and you're the flashpoint, why would you be the flashpoint? <laughs> you're the therapist. You're the one doing it. Who do you think is going to be the flashpoint, cowboy? So, you know, when you, <laughs> you start doing these things, you know, there will be a balancing. And so to me, it's best to keep the healing mechanism or the healing attention in the, in the, in the patient. You know, you feel something in the patient. You augment 
or amplify what you feel in your perception, but it's their stuff that you're augmenting in your perceptual field in order for you to help them or you're working on it, but you allow them to make the correction through your amplification. So uh, that's kind of a big uh, that's kind of a big piece there. But uh, for those of you who who um, can get what I was saying there, that might be useful. Um, I think I'm going to stop there for today, and hopefully some of this will be useful. <laughs>